Welcome to the Wish I'd Known Then podcast, where we focus on how authors found success, looking at strategies that have taken them to the top of the bestseller charts, as well as what they've learned from their mistakes. Because being an indie author is more than knowing the latest marketing trend. It's about being innovative and creative and learning from your mistakes. Welcome to Wish I'd Known Then podcast. I'm Sarah Rosette. And I'm Jamie Albright. And this week on the show... We have an interview that I did with Maddie Dalrymple on her Indie Author Podcast. Yep. So it is all about constructing a compelling series. Yeah, Yeah. I think that's awesome. I I love it. I love the interview and I think our listeners are going to really like it too. Maddie's awesome. She's been a guest on our show and she's a great interviewer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she asks really good questions Mm -hmm. and Mm -hmm. we got into some topics that... um, I've done some other interviews about the how to write a series book. And this one we talked about like how to end a series, mm. how to spin off yeah. you know, into another world and, um, you know, just dealing with boredom when yeah. you're writing a series and mm-hmm. things like that. So some of the kind of different topics. So it was mm-hmm. fun. So that's coming up. That's awesome. That's yeah. great. That's great. So, What's been going on with you? Uh, well, I am, I, I thought I was close to the end of the book oh. I was working on. I was like, yay, I'm so close to the end. And then I was like, no, I'm not. I'm mm-hmm. really not. You know, I got that. I know the rest of it. I know what I need to write. Yeah. But it just takes a while to sort out. And I'm at the point where it, the mystery, I'm having to make it all make sense. Yeah. And that's just taken forever. But I yeah. will get there. But anyway, mm-hmm. so I've been working on that. And that is like it. We've had the Easter holiday yeah. this weekend and everything sort of slowed down for that. Didn't do much work. I actually took Friday off, which mm-hmm. is really nice. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. That's great. So that's all I got. What about you? Okay. What have you got uh, same thing. I'm writing, uh, writing every pretty much every day. I did. T- uh, well, I t- took Friday off from writing, but I met with my friend Erica and we discussed uh, the lack of conflict. (laughs) You know, I'm almost to that point of, uh, oh, I had a good idea. Now I don't have a story. Uh So I'm trying to head that off. And um, I've been tempted to just not write because of that. But, you know, I, I have learned over the years that being in the story helps me better than I mean, I do need to think about it, but if I think too long, then I just don't get back in it Mm -hmm. fast enough. So we changed a few things and clarified their goal motivation and, you know, Mm -hmm. uh, what's the other one? Goal motivation. Conflict. Conflict. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, And a little better. And when we finished, I actually texted her and said, this is the story I wanted to write. I just oh, couldn't figure it out. So nice. Yeah, so it's good. But this weekend we had all six grandchildren. Um my daughter's an event planner. And so she um had an event south of Austin. So she got a house and the house had, you know, for us to come. Right. Because also it's Easter weekend. My son's in Austin. Mm-hmm. Because his mom's in Austin, north of Austin. And so we were just kind of all in that area. And, um, but she had this event, this wedding. And so the house had a splash pad and a bounce house and a swing set and then an outdoor like TV and stuff. So it was really nice. And, uh, we, but we had the kids all day Saturday and they're great. I mean, they're, you know, really one of them gave us a little bit of an issue, but, uh, it was, not one of hers (laughs) it was the (laughs) other one (laughs) and but we had five preschoolers five and under you know I mean that's just a lot even if the kids are really good they're still kids and they still have so much energy I totally get it right she's like I don't want you to do this if if it's stressful I'm like it's stressful because they're not our kids you know if something happens you know that's what makes it stressful it's not anything else we just don't want them to get hurt and (laughs) there's a lot to probably keep an eye on with all that equipment Uh, but it was super fun I taught preschoolers to play go fish old maid and slapjack (laughs) and we played cards for a couple of hours if you've never done that uh well Uh, that's that's a whole new thing that's a life skill they need mm -hmm, right mm -hmm. but I have, 
eating like crap all weekend. I didn't drink enough water. I drank too many Diet Cokes, you know, because I needed the energy, I thought. And this morning I woke up, my hands are swollen. My fingers are numb because I've got so much inflammation. I'm just, I got, I'm foggy headed. Yeah, it's, it's the whole thing plus allergies. So, um, uh, yeah, I've got to get back on taking care of myself because it was, but well, you get it was back fun. on focus this week. Yes. I'm yes, sure yes. you will. And I've already written this morning, <clears throat> I've written a thousand words, almost a thousand words this morning. And so that's great. So that's good. So I'll finish <clears throat> yeah. my words, uh, when we get off here, but, uh, yeah, it was, I'm like, it was I'm, quite a weekend. It sounds it was like fun though. We had so yeah. much fun. And, uh, uh, we got to we went to church with our son and his fiance, and then we went to Chris's mom's and had lunch, and it was fun. We had a great yeah. time. Yeah, that's it awesome. was great time. So, that's yeah, awesome. Anyway. That's but that's good. it. That's all I got. So okay, well, good weekend, good writing. Yep. All sounds good. It does. It does. It was great. Yeah. Well, we have uh, two new supporters this week that we need right. to give a shout out to. We have E R. Paskey, I believe is how you say the last name. With oh, fun. heart is an emoji. Yeah. And DD Lorenzo, Lorenzo with the okay. star emoji. So Love. Love initial it. theme this week. Yes, <laughs> exactly. I was thinking the same thing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so thank you so much for supporting the podcast. We really mm-hmm. appreciate it. Mm-hmm. And uh, thanks to all our other supporters. We we really appreciate it so much. But we should probably get on with this interview because it's really yes. great. Yes. So here is me and Maddie this week. Hello, and welcome to the Indie Author Podcast today. My guest is Sarah Rosette. Hey, Sarah, how are you doing? Good. How are you? I'm doing great. Thank you. To give our listeners and viewers a little bit of background on you, Sarah Rosette is the USA Today bestselling author of 30 Mysteries for Readers Who Enjoy Atmospheric Settings and Puzzling Whodunits. She hosts two podcasts, Mystery Book Podcast, that sounds good, for readers and for writers, the Wish I'd Known Then podcast, which I love. She <laughs> co-hosts that with Jamie Albright. And she also writes nonfiction for authors, including How to Outline a Cozy Mystery and How to Write a Series. And I was very intrigued with the How to Write a Series topic. And so I invited Sarah on the podcast to talk about that very topic. And I thought it would be helpful, Sarah, to just start out, give us a little background on your own series so we have some context for the conversation. Sure, yeah. I, I started out writing Cozy. And I was traditionally published first, and I wrote a 10-book cozy mystery series about a military spouse. That's what I was. And somehow I was like, oh, this could be like the hook for the series, that it's a person who moves around a lot and is involved in military life, because that's something people don't know about. And then, so I did that, and then I transitioned into a hybrid author, still doing traditional cozies, and then I did some indie books. And so I have a series that is, it's actually a throwback to classic romantic suspense. It's more Mary Stewart, Elizabeth Peters type inspiration. Oh, if cool. you kind of are familiar with those authors. Yeah. So, and it's like travel, mystery, intrigue, some murders, some not, art, death. It's like all this stuff that I just love. And it was kind of like my books that I just didn't fit any particular place. And I wrote them. And so they're cozy-ish, but not cozy. They have mysteries, but they're not straight mysteries. So like they don't fit anywhere. It's my first foray into indie publishing. And then I thought, you know, I might do better if I just wrote a straight cozy as an indie author. So then I wrote a series about a location scout who's working in England, trying to find locations for a Jane Austen adaptation. So it's a modern mystery set in England. And I got to indulge all my Jane Austen fan country house you know, oh, I love this country house. I want to go here and see this. And so I got to indulge all that. And that did well. And then I was like really reading a lot of 1920s and 1930s golden age mysteries. And I thought I would really like to write a book or a series set in that time period. So I took that same location, that series that I had done about the location scout in England. And I was like, it mostly takes place around a little village that I created called Netherwoodsmore. And I was like, what if I just take that village and go back to the 1920s and set a series in that village in the past? And so that's my High Society Lady Detective series. So that's by far the most popular series that I have. And so I'm continuing to write that. The other two I've kind of tapered off and 
I'm not writing novels in them. I might write short stories or, you know, do some kind of special thing with the other series. But basically right now I'm a 1920s country house mystery person. Oh, my goodness. We have hours and hours worth of conversation to have here. <laughs> we'll have to try to control ourselves. <laughs> so the one you said had some murder, some not. It, is that mm-hmm. a series or was that mm-hmm. a series? Or were those standalones? Uh, I originally wrote, I thought, okay, this will be a, a trilogy. It'll be three books. And I wrote those three books. And it's one of those series that like, if, once it finds its reader, the readers are super passionate about it, but it doesn't have a really big audience. But the readers who love it really love it. And so they would they were emailing me, can you write more? And I was like, okay, I could do another book. And so I wrote another book. And we may talk about this later about extending a series. Because when I got to the end of that book four, I was like, oh, I had an idea for how I could keep the series going in a new story arc kind of thing. A new, like the first story arc was complete in the first three books. Four book is book four is a transition. And then I continued the series for a couple more books because I found a new thing that my character could explore. So that turned into a longer series than I planned. That's really interesting. And something, I don't know if this is just like a one-shot answer or something that maybe we can, as you had mentioned, thread through the rest of our conversation is that idea that some murder, some not. I was just at a a book club where they were reading for my uh, Anne Kinnear suspense novel, The Falcon and the Owl. And it's the first one that has a whodunit aspect. but there's a murder right at the beginning and the whodunit is not the murder at the beginning. It's a death that it's not apparent that it's a murder until later. Spoiler Mm -hmm. alert, (laughs) later in the story. And we have this whole conversation, as I often do on this podcast, about the trickiness of having a series that has consistency like characters and like tone Mm -hmm. and theme and things like that, but not Mm -hmm. consistency in the sense of, is it a whodunit or not? Right. So where's the dead body? Yeah, where's the dead body? I'd be curious as we're talking to talk about like how consistent does one have to be through the series and those kinds of things. Any uh, initial thoughts about that? Well, I think that like I'm always very clear in my mysteries, the ones that are like who done it's like here's it's a murder and he you're going to get this cast of suspects and this. So I hope that readers going in know that those are definitely have a who done it and that that's the type of story it is. With these other ones, I tried to convey in the blurb and the cover that they're not cozy, but they have elements of mystery and intrigue in them. And some of the books do have a murder, but not every one. So it's in the, it's that the murder isn't the main focus. It's like the main focus is in the beginning, it's like she's trying to find her ex who has disappeared and she's you know, involved kind of in this more conspiracy type thing that she's, and that's more the plot. That's mm. the major plot line. So hopefully like the cover and the blurb and like how the book starts kind of convey this isn't a whodunit, you know, but it's, yeah. it is tricky because I don't feel like there's a really good category that you can put those in because they, they do have mystery. So you put them in mystery. So it's, it makes it hard to distinguish. And yeah, I think the blurb and the cover and hopefully your opening chapters kind of give that sense to the reader that it's not just a whodunit. It's more suspense, possibly with intrigue and travel. And to me, like a lot, there are more travel cozies now, but because that one has travel and international settings, I think people realize, oh, this may not be small town cozy, you yeah. know? Yeah. Very interesting. So in your book, How to Write a Series, you talk about three basic types of series. So what Mm -hmm. are those? Okay, so you've got the multi-protagonist series, which is like that is you have a, with each book, you have a new protagonist and the books are linked somehow. And this is very common in romance. Like a lot of times it'll be like a family or a group of friends and each book is about each friend or each one type. Um, Then you have a single protagonist series where you follow maybe just you follow one protagonist throughout the series. And then those kind of can be broken down into two different types. So you've got like the flat art protagonist. who doesn't change a whole lot. This is like pro James Bond, Mary Poppins, people who they don't have a huge change throughout the story, but because they're in the story changes. I mean, if Perot hadn't been on the Orient Express, 
it would be a completely different story, right? So right. because he's there, he causes things to happen and things change. And a lot of times there will be a small character arc or uh, character arcs throughout the series, but it's not like this massive um, information. And that's what you get in the third type, which I think of as the robust character arc, where you've got a big change. It's kind of the classic hero's journey. You start out, you go through this big adventure, quest, something, and then at the end, your character has changed. And that type has a natural end point. If you think about Harry Potter, he goes through all the things, and then at the end, there's a resolution, and it's complete. And usually that ends that series. So the robust character arc series, that lends itself really well to like trilogies, you know, fantasy, sci-fi. The um, flat arc, which is more episodic, that you see that I see that more like in mystery series, especially series that can go on a long time Mm -hmm. because they're more episodic. So that's kind of a high level overview of the different types. And I suppose a benefit of that first type with the multi-protagonist is that if you get bored with one, you've. That is right. And you could go almost uh, endlessly with that. Yes. And you can keep creating variations. Like if it's a small town, you can just keep writing about different characters in your town, you know, or you can have new people move in. Or if it's a family, it could be like, well, guess what? We've heard the stories of all the sisters. Now we've got cousins moving in, you know, to explore their stories. Yeah. So, yeah, it can be endless. Yeah. So. In the authors that you speak with and work with, do you find that people usually know what they're going to write as they're writing their first book, even if they don't know, you know, even if they're not sophisticated enough to refer to it in the terminology that you use, that they already have a sense? Or are there cases where somebody wants to write a series and they're thinking through it? And are there flags that would make you say, oh, you know, I would point you here, I would point you there based on what they want to accomplish or what they, Mm -hmm. either creatively or from a business point of view. Yeah, I think that's really hard because I think when you're first starting out, you're just trying to get the book finished. Yeah. And like for me, I read mystery. I loved mystery. That was, you know, what I knew I wanted to write. And that was pretty much what I was familiar with. So I've learned all this and figured kind of in my mind, I've categorized these things this way to help me figure things out as I've learned more about genre and different types of stories and story arcs and characters. So I think a lot of that may come as you learn more. So I think probably in the beginning, you're probably just worried about finishing the first book. But I do think it is good to have a plan. And like for me, I knew my book was going to be a cozy. And cozies are always series. I mean, it's not like I've never seen a standalone cozy. Yeah. Or they're not marketed that way anyway. Yeah. So I knew it was a series and I had some vague ideas with my first series about it. the next books, like what the plots could be about, the mystery plots. But I did not think at all about like my character. And she was a flat art character. I look back now and I go, OK, so that's she was a flat art character. And that's why a lot of the advice about the hero's journey, I was like, this doesn't really work for Cozy. I mean, it just you can make it work, but she doesn't have a big aha moment at the end of book one yeah. and then have another aha moment at the end of book two. It just doesn't work like that. So, yeah. so yeah, I think a lot of it, you kind of work your way into, like you get the book done and especially if you know, okay, my genre normally has trilogies or normally has five books, then, you know, like that's what readers expect. That's probably what you're going to write towards anyway. You think there are fashions or trends in <laughs> that because it, on the surface, a flat arc sounds like an insult. And I think that if one had been able to go back in time and and ask the authors what their plan was, they would probably have said, oh, yeah, I don't I don't plan to have this character change over time. Like it was intentional. It was like a, a craft failure on their part. Is <laughs> right. that do you think that's still true? Are either the robust character arc or the flat character arc still uh, desirable among readers or is one or the other more popular? currently? Well, I think a lot of it depends on genre because Mm -hmm. like I know in mystery, readers expect mystery series to go on for like 10, 15, 20 books. They're like, Mm -hmm. this is great. Like think about it. And in thriller too, like Jack Reacher, Mm -hmm. that's, I would say that's more of a flat art character. He doesn't change that much, but that's a long series. And then I think there, 
readers like going back to that world. They enjoy whatever world it is, fantasy, mystery, whatever. They enjoy going back to it. And there's a comfort and a familiarity of going, okay, I know who this character is. I know what I'm going to get, even if it's book 17 or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Um, The drawback is you can get bored with that as an author. You may be like, oh, I've written everything I can think of in this world or this series or this character. And I do think modern readers expect a little bit of a character art. Like I was reading the books from the 20s and 30s, those mysteries. And basically those were puzzle mysteries. And you didn't really learn a whole lot about the sleuths, their personal life, but just little tidbits here and there. But it wasn't like you had, they didn't change and grow that much. It was more like, here's a mystery. Can you solve it? Mm-hmm. And I feel like readers want more than that now. They want yeah. something extra. They need a little bit more. They still want the good puzzle like in my genre. They want the good puzzle, but they want a little bit extra, even if it's an episodic series. And I think the through line for your episodic series, your flat art, is really what's happening in the main character's life and all the subplots that are going on, all the other relationships, you know, people get invested in those heavily. Yeah. Well, I would think that if you're writing more of a, a flat arc series, then you have to rely more heavily on the other characters, not the secondary characters, but who, whoever are kind of the co-protagonists. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. The cast, the right? Book. The cast, yeah, exactly. <laughs> because like I... I um, Maybe I shouldn't admit this, but my only exposure to Jack Reacher is I watched one of the TV shows. <laughs> uh-huh. And I was really more interested in the characters that were surrounding Jack Reacher than I was in, in the Jack Reacher character himself, mm-hmm. which I thought was very interesting. Now, I'll see if I get angry emails about this, <laughs> but I was really not compelled by the Jack Reacher character. And then somehow I happened upon an interview with the actor who played him, and mm-hmm. he was very engaging and entertaining. It you know, seemed like the kind of guy you'd want to go out to a bar if, for a mm-hmm. beer with. Yeah. And I thought, man, I would have liked it a lot better if more of that had, had come through in the characterization. But then I said that to someone who's more familiar with the books. And they said, well, yeah, but that really wouldn't be true to the books then. Like, that's not the kind mm-hmm. of character he is. So, um, yeah, but I was relying on what was going on with the other characters more so right. to retain yeah. my interest in the show. Yeah. And I think that happens. I mean, we're like you... The flat art character that's like compelling and you're interested in that, hopefully you're interested in what's going on with them. But then all the other things that are going on in the world around them, that's mm-hmm. the thread that's going to pull people through, I think. Because you're, yeah. if you're not reading to find out what happens to Perot or, you know, Mary Poppins, you want to know what's going on in the family or the relationship. And a lot of times the flat art characters like if they have an antagonist, sometimes the antagonist is way more interesting than the main, than the protagonist. You know, you think about James Bond and the villains. Those are the fun ones that you're like, oh, this is interesting. What's going on here? Um, you know, that's sometimes the antagonist can almost overshadow the protagonist in some ways, like Moriarty and Holmes. You know, yeah. the, Moriarty is fascinating. You know, yeah. Holmes is fascinating, too. But you're interested in Moriarty as well, you know? Yeah. Well, it does seem as if I'm uh, relying on unreliable memory a little bit for this, (laughs) that Holmes was fascinating right from the get-go because of his um, idiosyncrasies. Mm -hmm. And then after a while, you know that he's going to do whatever the things that Holmes does, but then Moriarty gets added to the mix. And so Mm -hmm. I wonder if Conan Doyle was doing that because he was kind of tired of leaning on Holmes's idiosyncrasies in order to keep it interesting. And so he's th- throwing in this new person mm-hmm. to kind of shake things up. Yeah. And that's a great way to keep things fresh as you bring in somebody new, you bring in some different variable. Because like after you, a couple of books, you kind of know what your character, like your flat, flat art character, you kind of know what their reactions are going to be and their quirky little habits that are entertaining. But you still, after six books, seven books, three books, maybe you're ready for something new as, an, as a yeah. writer and a reader. Yeah. Well, that's kind of a nice lead into one of the other things I wanted to talk about, which was extending your series beyond your original plan. So I guess some of this also goes back to the character arc. Let's say mm-hmm. you're, you've started out and you think you're going to have three books 
and then you and the readers continue to be interested. So you're extending it. But now maybe you have to not only adjust the, you know, adjust your idea for additional books, but also the art. Can you talk a little bit Mm -hmm. about extending your series beyond the original plan? Yeah. So if you have a a plan and you're like, um, like that series I had, the first three, three books were like a quest. Could she figure out what had happened and and while unravel this conspiracy? So when that was done and they were called on the run and I was like, okay, if I'm going to extend this, I can't have them being on the run indefinitely. That's just crazy. So I had to figure out something else. So sometimes you have to tie off one arc and then come up with something new. So with that series, I was like, okay, what if she went to work for somebody and she gets involved in like art recovery? And so she's, it's an entrepreneurial arc after that. It's like, can she get the job? What can she solve her first case? And so that's like the next arc. So sometimes you have to figure out maybe like your character retires and then what are they going to do in retirement? Maybe they're a retired, I don't know, police detective or I don't know, magician or something. I don't know. And then they have to figure out what's going to happen next. So if you have a transition point, you can maybe find that a new jumping off storyline from that. There's a new challenge. Somehow, maybe there's a new rival competition. Something happens that gives you a new mix of challenges. Maybe they have a backstory you haven't explored, or maybe one of the side characters has a backstory that somehow your character is involved in, and it's a quest like at the end instead of the beginning like my book. So you can just, I think you take your world you have and you go, what have I not explored in here? And if it's a town, are there people in the town? Are there locations that you haven't delved into? Like for my 1920s, I've written a lot of the series is set in different country homes in England. And the most recent one, book eight, I take her uh, to Europe. She goes to Switzerland in the winter, goes to see the Alps, you know, St. Moritz and all that. So this is like a whole new area to explore, which will keep you interested as well as the reader, hopefully. Yeah. It would be interesting or important, I guess, to track what about the series your characters really like, because I'm thinking mm-hmm. of... I mean, Conan Doyle tried killing Holmes because he was so tired of it. So that's kind (laughs) of that was a no go. (laughs) That was a no go. But whoops. But I can imagine he might have said, oh, you know, I'm so bored with this. I'm going to mix things up. I'm going to have Watson, you know, move to the country and I'm going to give Holmes a new partner. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Yeah. And if people were reading that series in part because they loved Watson, then that that was going to be unsuccessful. And so those things that are both I think this applies Mm -hmm. to both extending a series, but also Addressing that situation where you yourself are becoming bored with it, understanding what you can change or Mm -hmm. what you can extend that isn't going Mm -hmm. to violate the contract that you've implicitly made with your readers. How do you assess those kinds of considerations? Well, for me, whenever I think about it, like I know that my readers are reading most of my books because they like the character, they like the setting, and they like the supporting cast. And if I'm going to take my character and I want to do something new and different. And maybe she, maybe I'm like, oh, she's always been in this little town, but now I want to write a book set in Asia or Europe. If I just take her, my readers are going to be like, oh, well, what's going on with, you know, all these other 10 people that I want to know what's happening in their life. So like sometimes that's when you get those books where it's like the whole village goes and travels. <laughs> you know, and Sometimes you can make that happen, but you have to think about Why are my readers reading this? And if they want those interactions in a certain location with a lot of people, it's probably smarter to keep the action where it is, you know, instead of trying to go to a new location, unless you're going to do like a complete reset. And sometimes people do that. They'll like take a series and basically end it and have your, the character move to a totally new location and totally start over. I wouldn't recommend that. I think that's kind of risky. But I mean, you could do it. (laughs) You probably just have to realize that it's as if you're starting over with a new series. So even if there's a continuing character, the protagonist, it's, you know, you're going to lose some people, but pick up Uh some people. But if you go into it with that expectation that you're not necessarily bringing along all your previous readers, Uh that could be helpful. Yeah, I think in that case, it might be smarter to do just a spinoff. Just take a character and if 
you know, you want to move your story to a new location or have a new, like if you're changing the tone, especially, you probably want to have a spinoff and, but then they'd be linked. And then your readers, which who found one would probably try the other one or reverse, you know, if they start with a spinoff, then they might go, oh, there's more books. Let me go back and read how it all started. And when you're thinking about a spinoff, I've occasionally had people say that they like some of the secondary characters in my Aunt Kinnear books mm-hmm. and, and ask about mm-hmm. uh, if I've ever thought about doing a spinoff. And when I yeah. play it out in my mind, I think some of those characters, they're like good in small doses, but mm-hmm. I think like a whole book of that particular character would be might be a little much. Be a little much, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so when you're assessing possible characters for a spinoff, or maybe it's not just characters, uh, can you describe when you think of Spinoffs, are there other flavors than spinning off a character, like a, a location, for example? Yeah, I would say you can do the character. You could take a side character, you know, and give them their whole story. But that is the problem. Like, maybe it's not ideal for a, a protagonist. Maybe they're better in a side character role. But then, like, you could, like, I did the location thing where it's, this is this village in modern times contemporary and then this is the village in the past so that way you're linking the village at least yeah that's Um, very cool i've never heard that before but that's super cool yeah and i don't know how much read through i get through from that but i mean i figure it's a way that if people are interested they might pick up the other series just because of the name other ways you could link or spin off would be uh, like i would think this might work in romance like maybe you would have a shop or a store and you would have different, or a hotel, they do that a lot. You know, like you have different stories with different people checking in and out, you know? Yeah. Like you, you could do the something like boat. that. Yes. <laughs> Fantasy Island. <laughs> there we go. Fantasy Island, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Um, and if you're assessing a character as a spinoff, are there any either green flags or red flags that would say this is likely to be a good or not such a good idea? Well, I guess it depends on what type of series you're writing. So if you're doing a flat arc, you know, do you have enough story around that person? Can you create enough story around that person to make it interesting and make it more than one book if you want a series? And if it's a robust character, like what characteristics, what change are they going to go through that's going to make it compelling mm-hmm. that readers will want to read? Because... I do know what you're saying. Like some of those characters are so fun to write as like the comic relief or whatever, but then can you sustain a whole book or a whole series with them being the comic relief? And then are you going to bring in somebody else to be the straight man? You know, like you have to kind of think through these things down the line. Like, can you do that for three, four or five books? Well, one of the things you said that I love was that you write short stories and anything, Mm -hmm. whenever I hear short stories, I'm always (laughs) immediately intrigued. And I think that's a great way to explore that. So one of the characters that people often say they would like to see in a spinoff is named Garrick Manser. He's in the Anne Kinnear novels. And basically, he's in there to be both Anne's mentor in the early books and then her kind of both colleague and competitor in later books. Mm -hmm. And he's very gruff and eccentric, and he won't eat anything but bread and drink water when he's in public. But then somebody's in his house one time and notices that there's a pizza box in the Uh garbage can. So that would be fun for a short story, but not, I think, for a novel length work. Talk a little bit about how you've used short stories in conjunction with your series. Well, so in my Murder on Location series, the one that's the contemporary set about the location scout, Mm -hmm. I feel like that has kind of run its course. Like I told the story I wanted to tell between the characters and it's kind of done. But my readers were like, oh, can you do something else? We want more, you know? I mean, that's a good thing to have. But I just can't think of a story arc and a plot, like for a whole novel. But I had Mm -hmm. some little ideas. I was like, oh, this, I could do this. So I've done some short stories in that. I think I've done two that just kind of continue the story, kind of like like little baby steps Mm -hmm. a little bit. And then recently with my first Kickstarter, I had an idea for um, a short story. And I was like, what if I turn this into letters? Because I, there's been, I've seen some like mysteries in the mail or these letter subscriptions that you can get. And so I thought, what if I turned it into letters from my main character and she gets involved in this mystery? And it's not, it wasn't big enough like for a novel, but it could be, I think I wrote eight letters. And so that was part of the Kickstarter. They could sign up to get the special edition hardcover 
or they could get the letters or they could get both. And so they're, they were mailed to, to you over eight weeks. And so each one is like a little, it's like a little installment, kind of like a little mini series, kind of, you know, like oh, wow. episodic, you know, here's what I'm in this town. This is what happened. This is the mystery. I'll write more when I know more, you know, and then the next one comes a week later and it's okay. That's this so is cool. what I found out. Yeah. So, it, and it's a fun way for me to try a different writing style. Mm-hmm. And I've always written long. So writing short is a challenge, but somehow writing the letters made it easier and totally different style of writing. So to me, that's a short form that I can explore. And the first one was about my main character going to visit her crazy aunt who like keeps peacocks and stuff. And so one of her peacocks had gone missing and she wanted her niece, who's so good at solving problems, to come find it. And she's like, this is not what I do. And I don't know how to do this. So, you know, it's kind of funny. Yeah. And, you know, got to, and I mean, I couldn't write a novel about that, but it could definitely fit in a shorter form. Yeah, I have found that I'll have ideas like sometimes I'll get and I'm realizing that I think the difference is I'll get interested in a not in something that's thematic, but something that's just topical. Maybe Mm -hmm. the opposite. So the example I always use is in 2019, I went on a cruise with my husband and some friends and we cruised around the Hawaiian Islands. And then we cruised from Hawaii to Vancouver. And I got, as is, I guess, a professional hazard as a writer, (laughs) I got fascinated with the idea of what happens if somebody goes overboard. And so I wanted to write a story about what happens if somebody goes overboard, but I didn't want to hang a whole novel off it. And so I I wrote a short story called Sea of Troubles uh, about that, Uh you know, just like four or 5,000 words, maybe 6,000 words about exploring that. Yeah. But but it was a topic, not a theme. Whereas when I'm thinking of the novel length works, it's more like how does someone balance privacy and celebrity or Mm -hmm. how does somebody recover from the guilt they feel about it? act in their past. So those are more mm-hmm. thematic, not topical. Right. And then a novel that's, you get to really explore all those levels and it's much deeper, I think. Like right. the short story can be deep in a way, but it's so short. It lets you hit that situation and kind of, it's almost cathartic cathartic you know like yeah. you've got these ideas and you're like, oh, I want to write about this, but yeah. I don't really want to write a whole book or a whole series. Yeah. on this one thing or this one situation. So yeah, mm-hmm. it makes perfect sense. And sort of to loop back to the whole spinoff idea, a short story can be nice because you could experiment with a, a character. Yes. And I think that people would enjoy, you know, a short story of Garrick Mazur, the character I was talking about from the Ann Kinnear ones. Uh, um, but I think it would confirm my belief that a novel like yeah. work with Garrick is not going to be good. Right. Yeah. Unless you kind of try things out. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And I did have the experience recently of having written the three Lizzie Ballard thrillers, and then I was working on the fourth Lizzie Ballard thriller, and I realized that a logistical problem I had is that the thing that happens to Lizzie Ballard after her last scene in book three could be days, weeks, or even months later. But the thing that happens to the antagonist at the end of book three is going to happen seconds after the end of the book. (laughs) And so I was really struggling with... how to handle that without having the first five chapters of book four be about the antagonist, which I didn't want. Mm -hmm. And so I ended Mm -hmm. up writing a novella, Mm. kind of a long, short story, short novella length work that is just taking the antagonist from the end of book three to the beginning of book four, where their chronologies match up. Mm -hmm. And that's one where I truly love this antagonist, Louise Mortensen, for anyone who has read the Lizzie Ballard books. But I'm not sure other people would want an entire novel about the bad guy. (laughs) But I had a lot of fun yeah. with it. Yeah, but that's a good solution because yeah. you get this, and your your readers who are very into that can read that and it will bridge for them. Yeah, I think that's yeah. a great solution. And I think from a marketing point of view, it'll be sort of a nice tease as I'm leading up mm-hmm. to the, to the mm-hmm. launch of book four. I can be offering that yeah. as something too. Yeah. To bring people forward. One of the other things you address in your book is how do you deal with the problems that result from being locked into a story world. And I think this is, we probably kind of talked about this Mm -hmm. a little bit about, you know, expanding things in a way that's going to be interesting for you. Any other tips Mm -hmm. there that we haven't hit yet? Well, for me, I'm a high input person. So if I can just find something that's related to the story world, so like the Jane Austen Country House Location Scout, if I can just find a book about a location scout or about country houses and just start reading it or, you know, watch a, like a, 
documentary or something. I will get ideas from that. The same thing with the 1920s. If I read some biographies, if I read about, you know, something that happened, you know, during that time period, like how they traveled. And I mean, that will fire ideas for me. So that may be something that would help other people. For me, and maybe look at a theme and say, okay, so this first part of the series is about X. What else can we explore? So maybe it's a, maybe you had a very strong romantic subplot in the beginning and now you want to transition to something else. You know, you just kind of have to think about, I mean, it could be something, it could be like revenge, like something happens and you explore the possibility of revenge or the push pull of, do I want revenge? Will revenge help? You know, like things like that. I'm a murder mystery person. So of course I go to revenge and dark things like that, but it could be anything, you know? So sometimes it's like maybe a theme could help you figure out, you know, something else you could explore. Yeah. I think even rereading your old books can help because I'm realizing that a way this has played out for me is that Anne Kinnear is a woman who can communicate with the dead. Mm -hmm. And I mentioned in book one that her parents both died in a car crash when she was in college to sort of emphasize the fact that it's her and her brother. She has a, at the beginning, she has a very insular world. It's basically her, her brother and her brother's husband. And, and I didn't want her to have parents or other kind of support structure beyond that. But then I was working on, I don't know, book six or something like that. And I thought, you know, it's weird that a woman who can talk to dead people, we've never addressed this question about, has she ever tried to contact her parents? And so I had started putting that in. I needed a subplot in book six because normally Anne doesn't get involved in a case Mm -hmm. until later. So I need Mm -hmm. something else going on to introduce her Mm -hmm. early and she's working on that. And then, you know, Mm -hmm. the two. totally get it. Yes. Yeah. And so I started using that as a subplot. And then I thought, you know, if you have the protagonist trying to contact her dead mother, that's probably not, that's probably a story by itself, you know? (laughs) And isn't that funny? That's something that you didn't explore early on, but it's something that's like describing it now. I'm like, of course, people would be curious about that and they would be interested in that. And so, you know, sometimes like just going over what what drives your characters Mm -hmm. and motivates them and things that they're involved with that can give you, you know, new ideas too. Yeah. So we've talked about ways that we can reignite our own interest and reader's interest, but at some point it probably has to come to an end. What are the signs that might be happening and how do you do that gracefully? Okay. So this is something I've struggled with a lot because like I said, mystery readers expect a series to just continue. Um, They want it to go on forever and I can't write every series forever. So for me, I thought if I become bored with the characters, if you're bored and you're like, if you don't want to write the books, if you don't want to go back to those characters, then that might be a sign that it's time to wrap things up. If you're out of ideas on how to make it interesting, if you're like, okay, I've written about all the stuff I want to write about, about this character. I heard one author one time say she knew she was out of ideas when she was writing the amnesia book. She was like, Okay, if I'm going to amnesia, then basically it's time to end this thing. <laughs> and I was like, like, okay. But then it's kind of, that's it. was all one. a dream. Yeah, that's but right. Yeah. That, that it's time to, time to call yeah. it quits. Yeah. And then I feel like if uh, there's no more potential for character growth, even in your flat art characters, usually you've got some challenges, some small things that are happening. And if you're kind of, reach the end of what you want to write about or what you can explore with that character, then, you know, it's probably time to move on. And uh, for me, I was very worried about how my readers would react. And so there's like the, how will readers react? And then there's like, how will it impact my writing, like my income? Because if you have a workhorse series that, you know, if I release a book, I'll make this much money, that can be stressful to decide to end that. So there's a lot of anxiety around it that I don't think people really talk about. So what I did was I've done two different things. One time I just kind of quietly stepped away and just didn't really mention the series and started emphasizing my other series. And then another time I said, hey, this series is ending. And I think for me that was better because my readers weren't constantly going, oh, what, is there more? So I just said, this series is done. I pretty much told the story I want to tell. And these characters, 
They're happy and they're content. And they're not discovering any more dead bodies. So we can move on. And I told my readers that I didn't have any more ideas that would support a novel. And I had so many nice emails from people saying, oh, thank you for letting us know. And, you know, I appreciate that you're not going to basically flog a dead horse until, you know, you know, and I was like, okay, that's, that's nice. And then for marketing, I tried to, what I've learned to do is if you can link your, if you're writing a new series, if you can link it somehow to the one you're closing off, that's smart. I didn't always do that. But if you can find some way, like through, like we talked about, like setting or character or, you know, some story world, I guess like magic, if you're using like some sort of magic, if the magic can continue in another person or setting, you know, then you can keep part of that element going to pull readers onto the next series. And I suppose if your goal is to write one very long series and keep your engagement and the reader's engagement, you could go into it knowing I'm going to start out with protagonist A and I'm going to have secondary protagonist B be a big part, but clearly mm-hmm. secondary. But then I'm going to have B's role become larger and larger. So mm-hmm. I could kind of fade out A if I get tired of A and now I yeah. can switch it. So it's the, you know, it's the life on the spaceship series and you're moving from the person who's the captain to the person who's the first officer. I don't know. Right. But yeah. Having that plan to say, oh, I'm going to have somebody in the wings whose mm-hmm. story and character really does support them being moving into the A position. Yeah. And I'm seeing more and more books, in, especially in the mystery genre, that are ensemble cast. Mm -hmm. And I think that would be a way you could maybe start out with their focus on one character, but you have, you know, four or five other characters that your readers are just as interested in. And, you know, like you can kind of, they can wax and wane as the story goes and you, or as the series goes, and you can highlight somebody's story in maybe book three or book seven that didn't have as big a role in book one. And that can give you different, uh, and, you know, it can just keep you interested and the readers interested too. Yeah. And I think another thing to consider is that are you tired of this for all time or are you just tired of it now? Because with my two series, I wrote two Anne Kinnear novels. Then I wrote three Lizzie Ballard thrillers. Then I wrote four more Anne Kinnear novels. And I have Mm -hmm. to say that by the time I got into the sixth Anne Kinnear book, I was really looking for something Were you missing them? (laughs) Uh, Well, I was missing the Lizzie characters. Yeah. Yeah. Um, And part of it was that I was missing the characters because they do become like your friends. And part of it, too, was that I realized that my books had gotten like, I don't really want to use the word cozier, but cozier and cozier, shading Mm -hmm. toward the cozy end more with each book. Mm -hmm. And I was really looking forward to writing some kick-ass fight scenes and letting people (laughs) get stabbed and things like that. And I thought, I just need to switch back to Lizzie because her world is a little more action-packed. And I just needed, I needed that as a refresher. And I have every, you know, I'm going to be going back to the Anne Care books, but if you have something you can switch to, if you can leave one series mm-hmm. at a satisfying point, but open so that if you mm-hmm. want to go back to it, you can and then switch to something else. And then you might go back to it refreshed. And I think, as you were saying, letting people know, letting your readers know kind of what's going on, because I think they appreciate that. They not only mm-hmm. appreciate that you're taking the time to let them know that, but they kind of enjoy the uh, glimpse behind the scenes of what's going on in mm-hmm. a writer's mind and in a writer's life. Yeah. Yeah. And I think there's a lot to be said for like you're talking about switching tones and stuff, like almost like a palate cleanser. Okay, I'm going to have this one. I'm going to leave it open in case I want to come back to it, but it's on hiatus right now. I'm working on this. And then when you're ready, you can go back to the other. And I totally understand about writing super cozy. That was why my second series that I wrote was just like, I had everything in it. I had the first series I wrote had a mom and she had to be, You know, she had little kids. And so she had to, I didn't want to be one of those writers who put kids in danger as a story element. So I was always having to shut all the kids off to the babysitter. And so like my next series of like, she's not going to have any kids. She's going to be impulsive. She's going to do whatever she wants because I wanted that change, you know, to explore something different. Yeah. So interesting. Well, Mm -hmm. this has been such a fun conversation. Thank you so much for joining me to have the conversation. And please let everyone know where they can go to find out more about you and everything you do online. Okay, well, my uh, website is sarahrosette.com. My books, you can find them for sale at sarahrosettebooks.com. And then if you're interested in the website, it's the Wish I'd Known Then podcast with Jamie Albright. And then if you're a mystery reader, there's the Mystery Books podcast.
Great. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. It's been a lot of fun. Thanks for listening to the Wish I'd Known Then podcast. We hope this episode inspired you, empowered you, and made you laugh a little bit too. If you loved it, tell your friends about it. And if you feel so inclined, leave us a review. We look forward to being with you again next week.